Hi. So, um, my name is Charles. I'm from SensePost. My presentation today is titled Love Triangles in Cyberspace. It's a little bit different to the kind of stuff um, that you guys have seen up to now. Um, uh, because I'm, I'm, it's not a technical presentation. I want to I offer some commentary on some of the kind of broader uh, sort of geopolitical movements we've been, we've been watching uh, in the world over the last uh, year, and particularly over the last few months. Um, to fill you in a little bit about uh, some of the things that have been happening, and then kind of try and bring it back to our space um, and, and offer some commentary, often some thoughts, on how I think it will affect our, our industry and what it potentially means for us. Uh, these are kind of new, they're fresh ideas. Um, I'm, I'm not here preaching a gospel, but I thought I'd kind of plant some seeds with you that, um, that you may be able to, to play with a little bit um, in your own minds. I, I recognize this is the first presentation after lunch, um, which is like graveyard shift. Um, and, and, and I'm worried because I don't, I don't have any calc.exes uh, to show you, but, <laughs> but I have compensated with the three, uh, three ingredients for any classic presentation, which is I have a lolcat, so you'll be glad to know that. I have a reference to Edward Snowden, um, and I have a picture of Vladimir Putin riding a bear. <laughs> so you've got some things to look forward to. Uh, oh, that wasn't supposed to happen at all. That's not, a good, that's not a good start. Let's see, we go from there, we go to there. Yes, aha, there you go. Um, this is Donald J. Trump, November the 9th this year. He was elected the 45th president of the United States of America by the great uh, people of the USA. Um, and I don't know how it was for you guys, but for me and my family, uh, we, we were genuinely taken aback. Like we, we, were, we were shocked. Um, m my wife was more than shocked. She was like dismayed. She was, she was upset by it. You know? She was really kind of shaken. Um, n not only by, I think, what it meant for the world and for geopolitics and for our country and for this, you know, this, the state of the human race, but also because we'd kind of been led to believe something completely different, right? The exit polls in the States had suggested that Clinton was going to win. Some were even saying... Uh, by a landslide was the sort of language uh, they, were, they were using. And yet, as we watched the numbers filter in, I was watching them on TV in the morning, it became very apparent this guy's going to win. And so immediately afterwards, you know, all the analysts and the press and everyone jumped into this massive um, discussion about, you know, how, how did that happen? How did we get it so wrong? Um, and a number of different theories were floated. This is really not working how it's supposed to. A number of different theories were floated about how it could have happened. And, and some were saying, oh, no, the, you know, Trump was better tapped into the American electorate. He understood them better. He read them better. Others were saying um, that uh, Clinton's followers didn't rock up. They didn't pitch. They were complacent. They were apathetic. They, they thought they had it in the bag, didn't rock up on the day, and, uh, and Trump stole it. Um, some were saying, look, this is, this, is a, this is a gender issue. The Americans aren't ready for a, for a female president. They just couldn't stomach the last minute. They chickened out. Um, there's other, you know, snide comments about Trump's hair. And then some people in the last few weeks started saying something about the Russians. There's this theory that got floated that said, we think Russian hackers swung the election in favor of Trump. And at first it sounded like noise, but eventually it got to the point that some actually very respected uh, computer scientists and uh, data scientists had a meeting with Clinton to say, look, you've got a lobby for a recount in some counties because the results that we're seeing are anomalous. The, 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 the variation from what the polls suggested in counties um, where there are electronic voting machines is significantly different from the variation in counties where there's not electronic voting machines. And so, um, and, 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 and so we can deduce that these electronic voting machines uh, played a role. There's, they were a significant variable in the, in the differences that we're seeing. Um, and we think these machines could have been hacked. Um, and it's not so ridiculous to think that the machines could have been hacked because uh, machines like this have been proven over and over again to be, uh, you know, to be vulnerable. C was it you doing the, the kiosk stuff just the other day? Uh, okay, he's not, he's not confessing. Um, <laughs> but anyone who's, anyone who's, who's kind of confronted you know, these, these sort of standalone machines, ATMs, kiosks, will know there's like, lots of vulnerabilities in them. Um, and also, the American people are very uh, willing and, and very keen to believe uh, that, Russian, that Trump has an association with the Russians. The Russians favor Trump. Somehow, Putin and Trump, I don't know, they, you know, they connect. They, they're like of the same mind. Um, and, of course, the Russians have got a history of messing around with, with elections. I'll come back to this in a little bit, but uh, we, we saw them in Georgia. We saw them most recently in, uh, in Ukraine. 
and uh, we saw the messing in the electro el American electoral system. Um, so this is a woman called uh, Debbie Wasserman Schultz. You might not recognize her, but she's quite a big deal. She was between uh, 2011 and 2016 the chairman of what's called the Democratic National Committee, which is the like our NEC, I suppose, ANC, NEC. They're, they're the party leaders. Um, and she'd risen through American politics and taken control of this very important, it's not a government body, but it's, a, it's, a, it's an American political um, organization. And uh, in uh, June, July this year, her email got hacked and leaked onto WikiLeaks, which has sort of become this, the, you know, the, the go-to place for these kinds of things. Um, and part of what those emails revealed were that she and some of her compatriots were conspiring to favor Clinton as the Democratic Party candidate in favor of uh, Bernie Sanders. And it was very shameful for her, um, and as a result of that she had to, after a long career in politics, she had to, she had to resign. And uh, the, uh, uh, what are they called, counter-strike, counter, counter strike, American um, incident response crowd, they went in and they said, there's not just one, there's two different groups of Russian hackers running around on the DNC networks, uh, Fuzzy Bear and Angry Bear or Huggy Bear, I don't know what kind of bear, but there's all kinds of bears running around in this, this network, so the Russians are doing it, and it seems pretty unambiguous that the Russians were all over the, the DNC, um, and it seems pretty ambiguous, unambiguous that the, the leaks of these emails into the public domain um, was very shaming for the Democratic Party and probably hurt Clinton's chances, at least at the time. This is Michael Hayden. He was the uh, head of the NSA, and th this is from an interview, incidentally for the guys in the room, this is from an interview on Play in Playboy magazine. Um, a very good interview that was done in Playboy magazine. So you can actually read Playboy magazine, and if your better half finds you with it, you can say, I swear it's for the articles. <laughs> it's because there is actually, this article was in Playboy magazine. So Hayden came out and he commented on it. He said, he said as far as they can tell, it seems pretty ambiguous. Um, maybe not the Russian government themselves, but some sort of Russian criminal organization acting on behalf of the Russian government was all over the, um, the, the, the DNC. Um, and we've seen this before. This is the comment I made uh, earlier. We've seen this, it's a pattern that we've seen before. Um, and I want to draw your attention to this place, the Ukraine, which comes up again and again, but it's going to play a sort of key part in, uh, in my little story. And not only Hayden, but also the boss of the, uh, of the NSA, uh, Michael Rogers, he said, look, this is a conscious effort by a nation state to achieve some kind of effect. What we saw in the DNC wasn't accidental, it wasn't um, uh, opportunistic. Guys were going for something and they had intent. So the question is, is my lol cat, everyone? <laughs> Seven minutes in, we already have one lol cat. Um, what was that effect? What was it that the Russians were trying to achieve by hacking into the DNC and leaking um, where Debbie's emails all over WikiLeaks. Well, this guy, the guy in the background, he's got an, uh, he's got an opinion on it. His name is John Podesta, um, and he was, he's an old Clinton um, stalwart and was uh, a Clinton campaign advisor during, during her campaign now over the last few months. Um, and his emails also got leaked. That's Gmail, not via the DNC and in a completely different place. Um, and they're also actually currently still being um, curated and, and, and leaked out via uh, WikiLeaks. So every you know, few weeks, the press have got another batch of things that they can run through and tell stories about. Does anybody know, incidentally, how his email was hacked? It's beautiful. It's, it was phishing. They sent him a mail from Google saying, your account has been accessed from, guess where? The Ukraine. It's been accessed from the Ukraine, and we believe there's been a security breach, so you have to hit this link and change your password. And apparently he took that email to his IT guys and said, what should I do with this? And they went, duh, you have to hit the link and change your password. <laughs> so, so he did, and now his email's all over WikiLeaks. And he knows, he's, 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 he's unambiguous about it. He's like, this is, why it was this is why it happened. The Russians went in, it was the Russians, and they went in because they wanted Trump to win. That's, that's the theory. And this, this theory is, um, is very popular in American, uh, in American politics at the moment. So the theory is the, 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 the Russians are messing with elections, um, American government officials are saying it, the Clintons are giving us a, a reason for it, and we've seen precedent for it. Uh, back in 2014, um, you guys will remember there was an election in the Ukraine, it was the sort of election that sparked off uh, what eventually became the Russian annexation of, uh, of Crimea, uh, which we'll come back to in a bit. 
Oh, nothing happened. Nothing happened. Something happened. There you go. Um, so there was this election in the, in, in, in the Ukraine. And 40 minutes, 40 minutes before the official election results were to be published, um, IT officials working for the Electoral Commission found a virus implanted on one, not, not on an elect vote counting system, but on a vote uh, displaying system. So not with the actual data set, but the thing that you would see on the, on the TV, showing that these guys, whose name I can't remember, but they're a very right-wing, like ultra-conservative right-wing um, sort of separatist party within the Ukraine, uh, were leading the elections with 37%. Their actual result was 1%. They'd actually won 1% of the vote. And there was a little virus sitting there that would show that they had earned 37% of the votes. And, and the IT guys found it, they removed the virus, and the results were, were shown as, they were, um, as, as was intended. Interestingly, the Russian press had already published that these guys had won by 37% before, before the virus was removed. So there's like a little bit of conspiracy theory happening there. Um, and, 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 and Americans like to believe that Trump has a connection to these Russian hackers because of this guy. His name is John Manfoot. He was Trump's campaign advisor up to about halfway through the campaign. And I don't know if you guys remember, he had to resign at some point and Trump brought a new guy in. The reason he had to resign is because the American public became aware that he had been the campaign advisor of this Ukrainian president uh, who eventually won the election. And that's what sparked off the, the, um, uh, the, the, the annexation of Crimea. So he's all tied in by this Ukrainian president who's a big buddy of Putin's, and he was an advisor to the Ukrainian, now he's an advisor to Trump. And everyone's like, eh, it's a little bit too co close for comfort. You know, we're all it's like a little bit like, like this. Anyway, so all of these factors together, the fact that the machines are vulnerable, uh, the fact that the Russians are in the DNC, the fact that the Russians have messed around in systems before, including by hacking election systems in the Ukraine, um, gets too much. And this chick, her name is Jill Stein, she was an independent candidate. Some of you may have uh, noticed her. She won like 3% of the vote or something. Um, she put up a, sh she kicked up a bit of a fuss and she said, guys, uh, this is too uncertain. Now, everyone's feeling uncomfortable. We we're like, there's too much noise. Let's, let's recount. And she raised some money and, and actually right now there's a recount busy happening in some of those counties where these, electoral, uh, these electronic voting systems were, were used. Um, and there's a lot of drama around that which I won't have time to, uh, to, 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 to bore you with. The bottom line from all of this is there's this message in the States that says the Russians are messing with our cybers um, and they're messing with it because of Trump. And it's a very popular message, popular enough to, to have driven a, a, a recount, an actual recount in the state. But there are also some sounder minds. And in some of these quotes, you're going to see some names uh, that, that we recognize. Dave Eitel um, runs a company called Immunity in the States. They're, they're a big deal uh, in terms of technical security. He's also ex-NSA. And he's like, you know, actually, when I look at this stuff, what I see is what, what we would do. We would find something that we can own. We own it. Then we collect everything we can, gobble it all up. And then we take it home. We're like, well, what do we do with this? Right? So, 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 th so this notion of, like, intent, the notion of, like, tactical intent that the Russians went after the DNC so they could leak the emails so that they can discredit Trump, uh, Clinton in favor of Trump. It's like maybe not exactly how he, he uh, has experienced it. And then some other commentators are saying, and actually, the DNC is not the only guys that fell to this. Um, the Republicans have fallen to it. The Republican National Convention um, has also been a victim. There's a lot of this stuff going on. Um, and Thomas Patacek, who uh, I think Mark, 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 Mark is a bit of a fanboy, uh, works for a crowd called Matasano. He's also like one of the big um, gorillas, I suppose, in our, in our game. He, he went so far as to say, look, the only thing that stands out about the DNC is that, um, is that they got found. He reckons that basically everyone else is being owned up. And if you look past the pictures in that Playboy article that I was telling you about, and you read the rest of the, the Hayden interview, he goes on to say, actually, um, what the Russians did with the DNC is not particularly remarkable. We're all doing it to each other all the time, right? They're all in our stuff, and we're all in their stuff. What is remarkable, though, is that what they chose to do with the emails is to publish them. They chose to publish the emails. And that's something he calls covert influence, which is unusual. It's not traditional routine espionage, which is what we're doing to each other stuff all the time. Um, it's something a little bit different. Um, and this is the thing that's making the, the, the Americans so uncomfortable. And it'll come up again in a bit. Anyway, so all of this adds up to my picture of uh, Vladimir Putin riding the bear. Because <laughs> we, 
deliver on our promises. It, it, it adds up to the American political establishment saying, you know what, uh, it's enough. I forget what the Russian word is for no. It's not net, hey? net is, yeah. yes, yeah. is that no? Yeah. Or is that yes, net, okay, and it's enough. Um, and they threatened to cyber, you know, uh, bitch slap the Russians back. Um, and nobody knows where, nobody knows how, but you know, we, we're gonna get our own back uh, against you Russians for, for all of this messing in our, uh, in our systems. Um, and as it turns out, not long after they threatened to do that, um, some emails of Putin's were leaked uh, onto the internet, revealing him conspiring with some of his associates about affecting the results of the elections in, guess where? The Ukraine, all right? So this whole story, everywhere you look, the Ukraine just keeps coming up, it just keeps coming up. Um, and you guys may, may remember, uh, Ukraine used to belong to Russia, um, uh, so Crimea used to belong to Russia and then was transferred into the, uh, to the Ukraine. And when, um, uh, when sort of political tensions really built up in 2014 after this election that we were talking about, the Russians said, um, look, actually enough, the, the people of Crimea belong to Russia and they want to be with Russia. And, and so they, they instigated this kind of silent, um, uh, what do you call it, like an invasion, a silent uh, occupation of, of Crimea. And it's politically quite a remarkable event. The, they will tell you that the occupation of Cri Crimea by the Russians, the invasion of Crimea by the Russians, is probably the single most significant um, uh, political threat, political, political event that Europe has faced in modern times, basically since, it's, since the post-World War II era. And you know that uh, NATO and the European Union could not move on that occupation for a year and a half. For a year and a half, they basically sat and watched the Russians take over Crimea and effect a, a, a coup there. Um, and the way they managed to do that, the way the Russians did it, is basically just sc by screaming louder than everyone else. The Russians develop this narrative about what's going on, which is on the one hand like completely false, um, but on the other hand has just like enough truth that it keeps everyone sort of g guessing and, and counter-arguing and checking their facts. You know that you hear people talking about like a post-truth world? The, the Russians are the masters of, of post-truth. They kept so much noise in the press and in the rhetoric about, um, about Crimea that it basically paralyzed NATO and the um, and, and, and the European Union for a year and a half until, this, until, until the occupation was complete, not done, fait accompli. Um, and nobody moved, and no one was able to do anything. And it turns out that's, that's the way the Russians roll. In, in America, when you talk about like cyber, and you talk about you know, computer network exploitation and computer network attacks and stuff, what they're talking about is people hacking computers. Russians have got a completely different view on it. What, um, what they talk about is something called network warfare, or information warfare, which kind of sounds like the same thing, but for the Russians means something completely different. Um, it's all about operations of, of influence. It's about changing the way your people and your adversary sees the world so that you um, maintain control of the information battlefield. And it's literally by injecting sufficient noise into the system at all times that nobody else except you actually knows what's, what's going on. And this is a method that the Russians have, uh, have, have, have researched and they talk about it. If you go to um, you know, army school in, in Russia, they'll train you on it and they've, you know, it's, it, it's a deal for them. And all that's happened in the last, um, the last few years is that um, the Russians have taken that ideology, that military doctrine, and they've applied cyber to it. So for example, um, they will employ armies, like literally hundreds of Twitter trolls, to sit on Twitter and say shit for them. It doesn't particularly have to be true or not true. They're just like injecting noise. The difference between them and us is they know who the Twitter trolls are, and we still have to figure it out, right? So you're faced with all this like, Wah! in the air the whole time. Um, but they kind of know who's telling the truth and who's not telling the truth. And they do it to keep their population under control um, and, to, and to unsettle their enemy, to disadvantage their enemy, because the enemy now doesn't know what's true or not true anymore. To give an example, one of the narratives that the Russians have used um, in Crimea from the very beginning is they've said, no, 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 what's happening in Crimea is it's, it's a Nazi revolution. The Nazis are taking over Crimea. And, and since 2014 until now, if you look at what the Russian press is talking about in Crimea, they'll say there's this Nazi uprising. And we had to do as the good Russian people was to step in and save the Crimeans from 
from these Nazis. So it's something that actually we're very, um, we're very familiar with, fear, uncertainty, and, uh, and, and doubt. It's something our industry knows uh, quite well. And the Russians use it with, um, you know, with, uh, with, great, with great effect in affecting their political goals. So how does that tie back to what's happening around the elections and um, all the noise about the DNC? Um, well, the CrowdStrike guys eventually um, nailed it. Um, and the point is, the Russians probably did hack the DNC, and they probably hacked a whole lot of other people. But their, their intent is not to try and gain votes specifically for one candidate in favor of another. Their intent is to create noise and uncertainty um, in the faith that the American system have in this process that presents them with the president, which is exactly what we're seeing happening now. And I don't think the Russians particularly mind whether it's Clinton or whether it's Trump. I think it would be very hard to predict whether one candidate would be more or less uh, favorable to your uh, political goals. But the uncertainty that they create um, is, is, um, presents them with a, with a great advantage. And that's kind of what the Russians are about. So, so why, do we, why do we care about... Um, I didn't even tell you I was going to put a picture of a baby in the picture. Huh? Because that one's a bonus. Yeah, wild card. <laughs> Everyone's getting one. Right, so, so why do we care? And I want to backtrack a little bit to the story of the DNC, because shortly after the hack against the DNC, that happened in sort of June, in August, these guys appeared on the scene. It's a crowd called the Shadow Brokers. It's a threat actor group. Um, this, is not the actual, this is not what they actually look like. This is a figure from a, <laughs> from a computer game. But they took the name. The hackers took the name Shadow Brokers. Um, and uh, Sh Shadow Brokers appeared on Twitter, first time nobody had seen them before, um, with, with, a, with a dramatic announcement. They, they announced that they were about to leak a, a set, a whole cache of hacking tools from the NSA's uh, technical access operations group, the sort of elite badass guys of the NSA. Um, Shadow Brokers reckoned that they had a dump of these guys' tools, including uh, zero exploits, and they were going to release them um, onto the market. And, it, and it, was a, it was a big deal, not just geopolitically, but also technically, because... Um, the exploits affected a whole lot of uh, perimeter security appliances. Uh, Fortinet was in there, and Cisco was in there, and Juniper was in there. Um, some like weird Chinese firewall called like Top Top Secure or something was in there. Um, and and from the little bit of the cache that they did release, because they released a sort of small part of the cache as a teaser, um, it was it was apparent that they had zero day vulnerabilities and they had weaponized exploits for these zero day vulnerabilities. And as a result of these, people were suddenly running around like, oh, we've got a patch now. This is affecting us. These, these exploits are, are affecting us. Some of those vulnerabilities dated back to 2012. So since 2012, the NSA has been running, a, running around with you know, ways to own up your, uh, your firewalls, your perimeter firewalls. And we didn't know about it. And these guys somehow knew about it. So a lot of theories um, as, to, as to where those exploits came from. And one of them, were, one of them was that's like some NSA contractor, kind of like a Snowden type story. This NSA contractor, he had the stuff, and he's been like carrying it out in his underpants, you know, one bite at a time, <laughs> um, and, uh, and and eventually, now he's, and they've been like lying in his boot, and he's been driving out with them. But there's another theory, and the, ther the theory that the, the, the that the shadow brokers put forward, this was their argument, um, is that the story starts with the crowd called the Equation Group, who some of you might remember as the guys who wrote Stuxnet and later. later Flame. They're like the they're like the, the you know the the big um, gorillas in the computer hacking space. Um, and what uh, Shadow Brokers was saying is that um, Equation Group had a staging server, a jump box somewhere on the internet that they were using to launch attacks from. So what happens is they own up this box somewhere on the internet, and then they drag their toolkits across onto that box. You guys, pen testers, you've all done it. Drag your um, your, your, your tools onto that box, you launch your attack from there, do whatever it is that you want to do, and then you reverse out again, right? And you take all your stuff with you. Except, according to Shadow Brokers, they didn't reverse out. They left some of their stuff lying on that box. And, um, and somebody found it. The, the um, Shadow Brokers found it. And that's how it got to be, got to be leaked. So it's a, little bit, it's a little bit, if you think about it, like... Um, your kid, you know, walking home from school and like finding a limpet mine lying on the side of the road that somebody like left there from the Mozambican war. He's like, oh, look, my, look what I found, you know. These guys had sort of been throwing really big bombs at each other and, and one of them just forgot to pack one away. Um, and these guys found it and they're like, oh, look, now we've got it. 
And what they did with it was really interesting. They, um, they offered to auction it. They, they released this, this little preview of what they had, which proved that the exploits were real and that, that uh, the vulnerabilities were real. Uh, it caused a lot of us to be uh, running around patching stuff. And then they had this much bigger cache, which they were offering to publish um, in exchange for like 10 Bitcoin or something, which uh, I don't know if they ever got. They didn't, eh? Um, and, and of course now there's a, lot of, there's a lot of drama around that and everyone's talking about like who and what and why and who are these guys really. And this is where Snowden comes in. Um, Snowden came up with a theory, which, which is the one that I li liked, um, which is that really who the shadow brokers were is Russian government, a or acting on behalf of the Russian government. And what they were doing is sending a warning signal to the American government about pointing fingers. So effectively the message is, look guys, Yes, we hacked the DNC. Yes, you caught us. Yes, bad us. But let's be honest, we're all doing it to each other. And if you're going to make a big noise about it by you know, attributing the hack to us, we can also make a noise, big noise about it. And here's an example of the kind of thing um, that we can tell people about you guys and your capability and what you've been up, up to, including the fact that you've been sitting on these uh, zero-day vulnerabilities for like, what, five years? All right. Um, so, so what's happening is really a, a game of like international intrigue in which the hackers are really just players, right? The, the point isn't the hacking. The point is some political objective. And the hackers are just like a part of it and, and maybe not even the part that we uh, would intuitively imagine they would play. The point about it for us is that at some point, because this is happening on the internet and involving technologies that we work with every day, uh, at the, some point it leaks, it leaks out. Right? At some point it starts to it starts to affect us, not just in terms of politics and world affairs, but technically, uh, people like Alan, I think you were affected by this, are now spending their weekends you know, patching their Fortinet because of what the Russians did to the NSA, did to the, you know, I don't know who, cyber, but could to all of these guys. And it's now spilling over and it's affecting us. I want to give you one more example of that. Uh, this is a guy called uh, Ahmed Mansour. Uh, he's a, a Saudi Arabian political dissident. Um, you know, stands up for human rights. He's been uh, uh, nominated for what they call the Nobel Prize of Human Rights. Um, and uh, he's very unpopular in the UAE. They don't like him. They don't like his message. He's pointing fingers at the government the whole time. And they've been going at him since like 2012. He's been arrested. His stuff's been stolen. His passport's been taken away. Um, they're really, really, really trying to get this guy in jail and keep him in jail. Um, and in uh, August, August this year, he received an SMS like this. I, I, I can't um, read Arabic either, but I, um, <laughs> I read on the internet. Basically, it's a message saying, look, we've got evidence of human rights abuses in Saudi jails, pictures. Click here to see the pictures. Problem is, it's not actual pictures. Uh, it's an exploit against his iOS, whatever it was at the time, iOS 9 point something. Um, and it turns out it's not, it's not the first time that he's been, been targeted since 2012. He's been targeted, um, 2011, he's been targeted three different times by three different um, groups in an effort to get onto his phone and, and, and own up his stuff. Um, and this time it was by this crowd, the NSO, N NSO, uh, NSO group, which is an Israeli crowd. We'll talk about them in a, in a minute. They sent him an SMS with a link. Um, and, but what makes this sort of exceptional um, relative to the other times is that the... Uh, uh, the attack vector that they were using uh, wasn't just social engineering. It was an actual exploit, not just uh, not a known exploit, a zero-day exploit, so unpatched even on iOS. And not just one, but they had to chain together three iOS zero days to potentially own up this guy's, to potentially own up this guy's phone. Um, and just to put that into perspective, there's a crowd you guys may have heard of them, called Zerodium. They buy exploits. They're particularly interested in buying um, uh, zero days, and particularly for mobile platforms. They've got like a whole shopping list that they advertise on their web page. And effectively what these guys do is they come to places like this, and they reach out to guys like you, and they say, look, we're looking for exploits. Um, and we'll pay good money for those exploits because we've got buyers for them. And those buyers are ex almost exclusively going to be armies, intelligence agencies, and maybe police who desperately want to get onto very specific devices like Ahmed Mansour's. And to give an indication of how badly they want that, as Rhodium published a bounty for iOS 9, and they were offering a million dollars 
for a remote um, for a remote RCE for an RCE on iOS 9. They've subsequently increased that to 1.5 million dollars as a standing bounty. So every time you bring them uh, an iOS 10 RCE, they'll pay you another 1.5 million dollars. Now, a million dollars is a lot of money, um, and 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 the the point I'm making about this is. So this is, again, this is a government thing, right? These are not cyber criminals. These guys aren't like trying to, you know, um, uh, trying to steal your, 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 your credit card information so they can buy like free shit on Superbalist. Um, <laughs> they, they want that guy, and they want him desperately enough that they were prepared to drop whatever it is that they spent on those three O days, plus whatever it is that they had to pay uh, NSO Group, plus all of the risk, because now it's burned, right? It's out there. Citizen Lab has pu published it. They're prepared to make that investment because they desperately want to imp have that specific political or geopolitical impact. And like we saw with the uh, Shadow Brokers NSA equation group story, eventually that stuff leaks. And just like in this case, we were patching our phones because of what the Saudis were doing against Mansoor with the help of the Israelis, right? So what's happening in this political sphere is, af is affecting us, but it's affecting us with budgets that we've never before had to imagine, right? M million and a half dollars for an exploit. Like, how do you go to your CISO and say, um, so listen, the bad guys are really up their game, uh, so we need to up our game. He's like, yeah, okay, what are we talking? He's like, well, you know, they're dropping one and a half bar US on a single exploit, so I don't know what you're spending, but it's not enough. <laughs> So what you see is, a, is, is, is this uh, cycle of what, what I call industrialization, where um, political agendas drive um, uh, professionalization. So they're like, oh, we want to get onto people's phones, so we need to find smart guys, smart hackers, to, uh, to help us get onto people's phones or onto their computers or into their networks or whatever it is that you want to do. So they find smart guys. Those smart guys says, look, um, we need exploits. So, um, so they go, and that creates a market with crowds like Zerodium and um, who are these French guys? Uh, Vupin, thank you. Uh, Vupin, who go, f cool, we'll either write or we'll buy or we'll source these, uh, we'll source these exploits. And it creates, a, it creates an entire industry, uh, like an industrial military complex where there's connections between private industries and government um, that are creating these tools, training these people. And I think what's really important, also giving people exposure to a kind of hacking and a, and a taste for success that I think we've never had before. So, like, I, I don't know, who are the pen testers here? I mean, there's half of you guys are pen testers. If somebody said to you, uh, you know Johnny over there who lives next door? I want to be on his iPhone 6. Um, how much is it going to cost me? You'd say to him, buddy, look, it's not, it's not going to happen. You know, Just hit him on the head and take his iPhone 6 maybe, but we're not going to own it, right? We're just not going to remotely own his iPhone, iPhone 6. Um, but someone, somewhere in the UAE, had a conversation with someone in Israel who said, mm, yeah, maybe, we could try. Um, and they've probably done it, right? They've probably run that remote exploit against, a, a, against an iPhone, and they've probably got a, uh, a back channel, and they've probably dropped their malware on that, on that phone. So the next time that guy's presented with a problem, like, you know, can you get on this phone, or can you own that, or would you dare to do this, you know? Those guys have got a completely different mindset to, to what we have. Does that make sense? Like the, the whole sense of the art of the possible has changed. Um, and, 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 and what that does, this is a really bad picture that I drew by hand. Um, maybe it doesn't make much make, make sense. But, but I have this theory that, that what happens is, is for us, like kind of the normal guys doing you know, cyber, cyber security, what happens is we, we look at the landscape and we, and we watch threats emerge, we watch risks emerge, we're like, oh, here's a thing that's coming, or there's a thing that's coming, um, and we better start preparing for that thing, and then we start to understand the threat a bit better, and as we understand the threat a bit better, we can defend ourselves, prepare ourselves a bit better, and um, in the beginning, when the threat is unknown to us, that's over here, this is like a Gartner hype cycle kind of thing that's happening, when the threat is unknown to us, so we're on this blue line, the threat is very effective, like we can't really defend ourselves against it because we don't understand it, it's unknown, the tools, the techniques, um, but eventually, our knowledge of the threat kind of grows to the point where we say, okay, actually, we get that thing. We know how to respond to it, um, and we can start to mitigate the threats. And then, over time, the impact of that threat uh, on our environments reduces until some point where it reaches some kind of acceptable, acceptable level, right? The problem is if, uh, 
if, if governments are running around and creating an entire market for things like, uh, like zero days and, 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 a, and a completely different, unprecedented kind of art of the possible, then we never reach that point. We never reach this tipping point. We don't know what's out there. We don't know how to defend ourselves against it. We've never been in the ring with someone who's actually chained three zero days to own an iOS machine. It's not an experience we've had, right? We don't know how to mitigate. And so, that, so the entire kind of balance of power is, is shifted by these government um, shenanigans. They don't actually have anything to do with us. But, but they have a really real impact on us. Um, and I've got a theory that our, our industry is um, sort of silently but, but quite tangibly being almost completely inverted by what's happening in, um, in geopolitics, by what's happening with, uh, I won't call it cyber war because I don't think it's quite cyber war, but sort of government-driven cyber operations is completely changing the rules all around us. Um, we, just, we just haven't kind of picked, picked up on it yet. Um, and I think that's a... And I think that's a very scary thing, and it, and it leaves us with a question of like, okay, well, where does this all go now? Like, how does this actually play out? If, if these guys are playing in, with a completely different set of rules, completely different budgets, completely different sense of the possible, completely different levels of human resources, you know, where they're hiring thousands and thousands of, um, of, of people and training them to be hackers. With the, the, I don't know if you guys followed the story, but the, but the British government just turned, uh, what is it called, Bletchley Park? How is it pronounced? Bl Bletchley. Bletch, Bletchley, they just, they've just turned it into a school for like savant kids. Like they're going to take like 13 year olds out of high school and put them in this, uh, this, this, this iconic um, historical monument to, 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 um, to computer hacking uh, and teach them to be hackers like from high school. I mean, like, uh, how do we deal with that? How do we know what that, what that means for us? And I think what's going to happen is we're going to see two kinds of... Uh, kinds of operators emerging. And before I say anything else, I just want to apologize to this guy on the left, on the right, because um, he's actually much skinnier in real life, but I had, to, I had to shape the picture to get it to fit nicely into the box, and then he came out looking a little bit like he hasn't trained for a while, but he trains every day. <laughs> um, that's like, he doesn't have a podgy face like that. So what, what I think is you're going to get two, kind of two kinds of orientation. Uh, the one orientation uh, the boring guy on that side is um, is going to be insurance oriented. It's going to be it's going to be um, uh, it's it's going to be focused around um, risk management effectively by insuring for residual risk. And the reasoning is going to be: look, we can't. We as a normal civilian business, a mom and top shop, mom and pop shop with a you know with an e-commerce site and some guys using Windows 10 and you know a couple of other guys using Android and a POS um, and all of these things that um, we're seeing getting owned up all the time. We can't realistically expect to defend ourselves against the shadow brokers and the, and the equation groups of this, of this world. It's not a fair contest. We're not playing. So what we're going to do is we're going to do what's reasonable, what maybe best practice calls for. Uh, we're going to put those things in place, kind of like you would do with the business on the high street. Um, and anything else that happens after that, you know what? I'm going to call up my broker and say, they own me again. How do I claim? And you're just going to offset. And for businesses, I actually think that's not an, that's, that, that, I think it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a familiar route to take. And you've got a certain amount of risk. You, you, um, you, you, you cover your residual using insurance. And, and management and leadership in the business kind of know what they're in for. And they don't have to worry too much about all the like, cyber that, um, that's so scary and unpredictable. That's the one route. I think there are other businesses and organizations for whom that won't be an option that will say, look, we can't insure against the kind of uh, threats that we face. Um, a, a compromise would be unsurvivable for us, or the consequences in, in, in would, would be um, unacceptable. And I think basically those guys are going to get badass. And they're going to get badass using the spillover from this industrial military complex. Because what's going to happen is guys are being taken into the NSA and into Cyber Command and into the FBI now. We've just gotten like a large-scale mandate to basically hack, any, hack anything that they want. Those guys are going to spend four years there, or eight years, or 12 years, or 20 years, and then they're going to leave, and they're going to join a consulting company, and they're going to bring all those connections, all of those tools, all of that experience, like all of that stuff that they've gotten from actual, if you like, cyber combat operations, they're going to bring it back into the private sector. And if you've really got something that you think, I can't afford to have this thing hacked, what you're going to end up doing is calling a group like that and saying, hey, how do we deal with it. And the guys will be like, oh yeah, we, we know those Russians. Oh, we know those Ukrainians. We know how the Chinese operate. We'll sort them out for you. Um, and it may not work in ways that like, like we're familiar with. 
And you're kind of seeing that already, right? So NSO group, they're all ex-Israeli signals intelligence. It's, it's like it's, it's a standard MO for the, Isra for the Israelis. You go to the army, if you're really smart, you go into signals intelligence, they teach you cyber, you leave, and you start up a cyber company. And it was those guys that chained the three um, zero days together. Now, in this case, it's offensive operations, but I think you'll see similar things happening in, in defensive operations. On the other side of the fence, we're seeing similar things. We're, we're seeing the insurance thing happening uh, also. This guy's a guy called Ed per Permult. He's very curious, he's a funny guy. Um, and he's, a, he's, a, he's an American politician from uh, the seventh zone in Colorado. I don't understand how American politics works. But he's forwarded this bill, he's proposed a bill in the States that, uh, that effectively suggests that American companies who comply with a set of standards laid down by the NIST, by NIST, um, will receive a discount on cyber insurance. So what you do is you go to the government and you say, okay, look, I've done these 10 things that you said we should do, so I'm you know, a reasonable man. I've kind of done everything you can expect me as a normal business to do. Uh, I need cover for my residual risk. And the government will say, cool, we'll subsidize that cover. Go and buy it from these, uh, go, go and buy it from these 10 companies that we, uh, that we support. So they're offering a 15% tax credit against cyber insurance provided that, uh, provided that you comply. Um, and of course, the cyber insurance market is loving it. Uh, they're predicted to triple by 2020 um, and reach like a market size of $7.5 billion. I don't actually know if that's a lot of money or not. I mean, like relatively speaking, but it sounds like a lot of money. All right, so those two, those two models are already starting to present themselves. And so I think, um, kind of just to wrap it up, there's a lot more that can be said on the subject, but I only have so much time. To wrap it up, I think we're sort of seeing ourselves at a bit of a, at a, bit of a split in the road. Um, and I think we're going to start seeing um, players emerging on both sides of this, of this split. I think in the meantime, there's a lot of stuff that's still to be done here. But I imagine for those of us operating in this space, we're going to find our legs getting like wider and wider and wider apart. As we kind of have to decide which route it is that we want to take. Um, and that's, uh, that's me. Thanks very much.